We have a lot to talk about. Stamps on this video, you will realize that this is one of the biggest episodes of the history of handgun of Colt we have ever made. This and the 1851 Navy. And that is because there are many more resources for both of these revolvers than for many of the others in the series. I'm going to give you the resources that I use right here. Of course, first of all, I always use the book Haven and Belden as the general go to overall view of the gun. For the history of Colt's life in each episode, I generally go to Colt, an American Legend by William Hosley. <laughs> and today, the most valuable book I am using is the Colt Model 1860 Army Revolver by Charles W. Pate. This is 467 pages of nothing but 1860 Army Revolvers, and it is invaluable to the research for this video. If you want to know more about the 1860 Army, I highly suggest you get this book. If I was to cover every facet of what this book can tell you about the 1860 Army, this would be a 16 hour video. And I'm just hitting the highlights, on with the episode. Well hello again everybody out there, this is Garrett with the 11 Bang Bang channel and today we are back with part 7 of the history of the handguns of Colt. I know, it looks like we have quite a few firearms out here, and these are actually pretty much all the representations of the Colt Cap and Ball firearms, with the exception of the first second model Dragoon and the Baby Dragoon. We have the third model Dragoon and the 49 Pocket model. Thus far, we've covered everything from here to here. Last time we were here, we talked about this little bitty 31 caliber Pocket model, the new Pocket model, the Root Revolver, or the Side Hammer, whatever you want to call it. Now it's time to move forward, and here we go. 
So let's step back in time just a little bit. If we go all the way back, of course, to the Patterson, we realize that this is a fairly handy sized pistol. Uh, but it has a lot of issues. Uh, that trigger coming down, uh, it has a very finicky action. No trigger guard. You have to disassemble the gun to load it. Colt built that in 1836, and then in 1847, of course, we come up with the big powerhouse, the Walker. This is the most powerful of Sam Colt's designs while he was alive. And then we come down here to the Dragoon. This is where things started really kicking off for Colt. This thing is popular. It doesn't have the uh, strength issues that the Walker had. It holds a slightly smaller charge, shorter barrel, bigger forcing cone, better action on account of a different style spring and a different style roller on the back of the hammer. If you want to see more on this gun, go ahead, go back and check out our Dragoon episode. Of course, this was just way too heavy to be carried on the belt. I mean, it weighs almost four pounds. So the next gun that Colt came out with was the little 49 pocket model. And this is only a 31 caliber gun because of the hammer cast steel that was being used at the time. The only way you could get a gun this small was to make an extremely small caliber gun that had a small bore and carried a small charge. This one shoots usually about a 13 grain charge. Whereas you can get a 40, maybe even 50 in the Dragoon. So Colt had a happy medium with a 36 caliber 51 name. And now this one's an original. It wasn't in our original episode. We need to go back and do an episode just on this one. But he did go ahead and he made the 51 Navy, which is an excellent little gun. It's my favorite and it's light, it's handy. It's 36 caliber though, because we still cannot contain the power of a 44 caliber in something this small because nobody's behind the camera. You see how thin the cylinder walls are on that and you compare them to the cylinder walls on the Dragoon, you can see the massive amount of iron that goes into this and the not so much massive amount of iron and weight that goes into the 51 Navy. Now the 51 Navy is powerful enough for most applications. Uh, it still would uh, be one of the most popular full-sized handguns up until the 73 single action. But you still have this and this was the most popular but it's really small. And then in 55, of course, we have Colt coming out with the Root Revolver. And this one is a 31. Most of them are actually in 28. It's not any more powerful. The steel is a little better. It has a top strap. But it is getting better. And that all has to do with a thing called the Bessemer process. Now, as far back as the early 1850s, people had been clamoring for this gun to be just a little lighter because they did love the knockdown power that these 44s had. All right, so what we have going on here is all of these pistols, and I'm gonna make a incision right here. All these pistols from here back are made with what we would now call malleable iron. It's not cast iron. It's uh, what we call rod iron. It's hammered cast steel. It's made in a completely different way than what we think of cast iron today. It's not pot metal but it is a weaker form of iron, not nearly the amount of carbon that you get from later on steels. In London, in 1858, a man named Bessemer came up with a process to make a better steel and make it cheap. Of course, steel, high carbon steel even, had been around for a thousand years at that point. Think back and think of swords of the medieval ages, especially the high-priced, high-valued swords were made of incredibly hard, high carbon steel for the time. Swords that you could literally take and nearly bend over to touch each other, some of them. Of course, that's not the sign of a great sword, but some of that steel could handle such strain. Anyway, in 1858, Bessemer comes up with this idea of not only will he heat the steel and pour it from a cauldron, he will also pump it full of air. And the air will come through the bottom, through the top, and flow the impurities out by blowing them out through bubbles in the top. And then, when you feel that all the impurities are gone, a controlled amount of carbon would be reinserted into the melt. And it worked very, very well, actually, because even though there were a few air pockets in this steel, and it was, still was not the kind of steel that we would have today when you think of fluid steel, it was much stronger than your old hammer cast iron or hammer cast steel. So, when Colt found out about this Bessemer process, he was... Uh, all too happy to get over there and get some for himself and what it allowed him to do was to take the 
weight and heft of this big old 44 caliber gun, but what he wants to do is make a gun the size of this. And I'll hold them up against each other. Yes, there is a huge difference. This gun is a pound and a half lighter, and uh, all we need to do is figure out how to get this big 44 caliber bore into this little gun. So in the late 1850s, Colt would make contact with a London steel manufacturer known as Firth and & Son, and they would provide him with what he called silver spring steel. Now, I know this is a lot of talk about steel, but it's very important to the development of the further guns in the history of the handgun to Colt. Now, silver spring steel did exist, and the belief is that by adding a small amount of silver in with your carbon to the Bessemer process, you could make an even stouter steel that was more flexible and had stretch in it but was, that would not basically would not crack under pressure. Now, did Colt actually have silver spring steel? Well, an author of the name of Norman J. Whistler made a test on guns that were made with quote-unquote silver spring steel and the old Colt Dragoon. And what he found out was that the silver spring steel had no silver in it. However, it did have a carbon ratio of 0 .095 in some guns up to 0 .125 in some guns. And now what that did was it made the more modern post-1858 guns of Colt about 30% stronger than the old Dragoon. Now that 30% is a lot. However, Colt didn't claim 30%. When he made his advertisements for Silver Spring Steel, he claimed it at 300% stronger than the old Dragoon. But, however you look at it, 300 or 30, not that big of a difference, is it? Alright, I know it is. 30% is still pretty strong. So, with this better steel, he actually has the ability, it's time to go ahead and let's attempt to make a lighter 44 caliber gun. Now, of course, the first thing that he had in mind was to take the old 51 Navy and simply bore it out to 44. We have an issue here. By boring this out to 44, you can do the barrel, but when you get back to the cylinders, you are nearly getting through the sidewall of the cylinder. It's just not big enough. So what did he do? Well, first of all, he tried to go up not to 44, but to 40. And there is actually a Colt revolver, 51 Navy, that was made in 40 caliber. And it worked just fine. The only issue was the old 51 Navy was called a 36, but it was actually a 38 caliber. So he was only gaining two calibers. It was not that big of a difference in the power factor. So obviously the next step is to take our 51 Navy and instead of just simply boring it out, we're going to have to make the cylinder a little bit thicker. A little bit heavier, but a little bit thicker. As we discussed before, there's no way to bore this cylinder to 44 without coming clear through the walls. So Colt would have what he called the stepped cylinder or the belted cylinder or the rebated cylinder or the cavalry cylinder whatever you want to call it nowadays and what they did was they took the 1851 navy frame as you can see right here I know there's a little nick in that one but it does not go all the way through this is completely flush with the bottom of the cylinder now if you'll observe on this 1860 army there is a cutout in what we call the water table that allows the cylinder to be bigger at the front while maintaining the exact same size as the Navy at the back. And so what you get is a much more solid, sturdy front where your ball and everything is going to be loaded. And you can still put the 51 Navy hammer, 51 Navy frame with the cut in it, 51 Navy trigger, 51 Navy springs. Basically everything inside of here is an 1851 Navy. Now today it is very popular for people to take the 1851 Navy and simply add the cavalry style cylinder and still call it 1851 Navy but call it a 44 caliber 1851 Navy and many people will be very quick to jump on them and tell them that in history there was no such thing as an 1851 Navy in 44 caliber well that's true and not true this is an 1851 Navy in 44 caliber there's only one in existence it was a prototype made by Colt However, if you look at it, it doesn't look exactly like what we would think of a Navy today. It has the fluted cylinder and a rounded barrel. But with the old style loading lever, 
and the 51 Navy grip, this is technically an 1851 Navy in 44 caliber. So yes, though there's only one of them, they technically did exist. So in January of 1860, Colt would come out with this pistol, what we call today the Model M. Now if you look at this pistol, you'll notice that it has a cobbled together looking root loading lever and a navy size grip. It also has a rounded instead of octagonal barrel. And there are a few reasons for that. One, it saves weight. And two, it's just plain easier to manufacture. It is much easier to polish a round barrel than all the flats that are on an octagon barrel, therefore making it cheaper and lighter. In March of 1860, Colt came out with the first all one piece, not what he would call the 1860 Army, just like he didn't call the Navy the 1851 Navy. This was known as Colt's New Model Army. Yeah, confusing, right? There's that other New Model Army out there too now. So, for the remainder of this video, even though it's officially known as Colt's New Model Army, we're going to refer to this gun as the 1860 Army. Now, what do we know about this first official 1860 Army? Well, we don't have it, but we have a drawing that Colt made of it. You would think it would look like this. This is what everyone thinks of as the first 1860 Army with the fluted cylinder. However, not so. The very first 1860 Army off of the factory shelf would look just like this. The 1860 everyone knows with what they call the rebated cylinder or the belted cylinder. On May 18, 1860, a military board was drawn up consisting of Lieutenant Colonel J.E. Johnson, Major William Emery, Captain William Mayneter, and Captain John W. Davidson to examine the new Army pistol, testing two of them. They had one with a 7.5 inch barrel and one with an 8 inch barrel and a round and not fluted cylinder. This is the report. The board first made careful examination of the improved revolver from which they are convinced that it possesses decided advantages over that which it is designed to supersede, not only from its reduced weight, but also from its superior model, which is apparent at first view. There were two revolvers of this model presented for examination, differing only in the length of the barrel, one being seven and a half inches long, the exact length of the old model, and the other half an inch longer or eight inches in the barrel. To ascertain the strength of the new model pistols, the chambers were each loaded with government powder to their utmost capacity so as to admit the insertion of an elongated ball, which was rammed firmly over the charge. They were fired with these proof charges without any injury resulting. In order to ascertain whether injury might result from using either accidentally or from necessity the carbine cartridges, for a different arm of the same caliber and fired without injury to the arms. The only difference being an increased ratio of penetration. The arms were loaded and capped and then loose powder was scattered around the percussion caps and also around the balls and then they were fired without producing any premature discharge or communication of fire from one chamber to another. The results of all the examinations and trials by the board leave no doubt in their minds the decided advantages which Mr. Colt has gained for his pistol by the introduction of his recent improvements. The superiority of Colt's revolvers as an arm for cavalry service which has been well established is now fully confirmed by the production of the new model with the 8 inch barrel. There are a few minor points requiring modification to which the manufacturer's notice has been called and to which he should be required to attend in any arms of the kind he may furnish for government use. Number one, making the ramrod spring stronger so that the rod will not be started by firing. Number two, increase the length of the stock of the new model pistol so as to make it fully as long as the stock of the old holster pistol. Number three, enlarge the space within the guard by rounding it underneath and make the point of the trigger straighter. With these modifications, the board is satisfied that the new model revolver with the eight inch barrel will make the most superior cavalry arm we have ever had, and they recommend the adoption of this model and its issue to all mounted troops. So, now that we have 
the better steel and the better revolver, which the army really, really likes, we can take everything from here back and basically do away with it. And that was easy. All right, here we have the three pistols we're dealing with today. All of them what I refer to as 1860 armies or Colt new model armies, if you want to be precise. All right, so the military trials are done. The military absolutely loves this gun, especially Captain Maynard. Maynard, however you want to pronounce his name. But what is the price going to be? Well, Colt states that the price should be the same as his original Dragoon model at $25 a piece. Now, let's think about that. To us, that doesn't sound like very much, but this is the year of 1860. Let's adjust that for inflation. Today, if you were to buy that gun, it would cost the government $837. Now, to us civilians, $837 for a high-quality revolver sounds high-end, but, you know, it's acceptable for a good-quality revolver. Not to the military. The government never pays what we pay. So I did a little research. I found out that in 2017, when the government purchased the Sig Sauer P320, that SIG only charged the government roughly $207 a piece for that pistol. So let's adjust the inflation backwards. Let's adjust the inflation all the way back to 1860 prices. If the government paid $207 in 2017 for the SIG P320, they would have paid in 1860 a grand total of $6.27. Yeah, this 1860 army thing was expensive. And you may ask, why is it so expensive? Well, for one, there's nobody else out there making them. Colt has patents on a lot of the things that the Army likes, like this creeping loading lever. That's Elijah K. Root's patent, and it's not very old. They also have patents on the lead-ins into the cylinder notches. Colt still carries that patent in 1860. And so no one else can make a revolver as good as this. Nobody. Now, Samuel Colt had the government over a barrel on this. If they wanted this 44 caliber pistol in 1860, they had to come through him if they wanted one that was this handy. He could charge basically whatever he wanted. Now, there were a few issues with that. Like not too long after, another Samuel came to town. His name was Samuel Remington. And he brought his new model army. And he charged the government what he said would be a fair price of $15 a piece. $10 less than the 1860 army. Of course, the government took him up on it. The only issue was he couldn't produce nearly as many as Colt, nor did he have the interchangeable parts that Colt had, nor did he have Elijah K. Root, nor could he just be as consistent as Colt. However, that price was very alluring to the government. However, in March of 1860, when the military tested this gun, Samuel Colt had no worries about anybody named Remington coming in and taking over his share of the business. As a matter of fact, he only had a few worries. One called Sharps. Yes, the Sharps carbine, the paper cutter, the 1859 had just come onto the market and the cavalry units all around the country were loving this gun. It was not as fast to shoot as a Dragoon or a 51 Navy, and of course it was far more accurate with its long barrel. It was a single shot, but it was a breech loader. And like I said, although it could not hold up to the speed of the Colt, it could way out power and way out shoot the Colt at long ranges. Now in 1858, the government had tried to remedy the shortcomings of the Colt revolvers by adding a stock to them. And we will have a complete episode all its own on stocks in the near future stocks for the 1860 Army, 1851 Navy, and the Dragoon. And that was what Samuel Colt thought was going to win the war for him, the war between him and Sharps at the time. As a matter of fact, he wrote a letter. And in this letter, Colt stated in 1860, Soon my arms will be the only arms for mounted troops, referring to his guns with the stocks, of course, and that those of Sharps and the less notorious newfangled breech loaders will soon be consigned into oblivion. <laughs> I get a kick out of that. Samuel Colt saying that something new is newfangled and will soon be assigned to oblivion. We can see there was obviously a little bit of jealousy going on between him and Sharps. As a matter of fact, the Colt and Sharps company would keep up a very steady 
competition for many years to come after this. Now, on June 23rd, 1860, in Congress, with the help of one Jeff Davis, a bill was passed, and this bill stated that the government would no longer buy patented firearms. They could only purchase arms through government arsenals. The reason for this bill, many people thought, was Colt because Colt was making hand over fist money out of these pistols that he was selling at $25 a piece when a standard military musket could be purchased for 13 and the Remington revolver could be purchased for 15 in the next year or two. And the government just thought he was making too much money. A lot of people were very jealous of what was going on there. And let's be honest, Samuel Colt wasn't exactly cutting his profit margin to cut the government a deal. So, for a very short time, something interesting happened. As this bill was making its way through Congress, an amendment was raised that stated that yes, the military could only buy their arms through government arsenals with the exceptions of revolvers and bayonets. And as a matter of fact, some of Colt's best friends at the time thought that maybe he had put that in there. There are letters written to him stating that. And I'm not saying he did or he didn't. It, it would have put him in a very good position because that would have put Sharps out of business and kept him in business. The only problem is the amendment didn't pass, but the bill did. And in 1860, with Colt sitting here with many, many of these 1860 armies made, they had already gone through military trials. Nobody was there to buy them. The government had made it illegal for the military to purchase his firearm. But let's talk about this firearm in question here. Putting these aside for now, as you'll recall, our first tested gun looks similar to this with what we call the rebated or the belted cylinder. Colt is still trying to save weight. Now the best way he can think of to save weight is to flute the cylinder. But now's the time to come in here and take a closer look at what we consider the first model of the 1860 Army. What we have here is the Uberti. This is a Cimarron imported Texas model 1860 Army. This is a Pieta model 1860 Army. If you look in the cylinder, you'll see it is loaded with lead, but there is no primers or caps on it, so it's perfectly safe. And down here at the end, we have the real treasure. This is an original 1860 Army produced in 1862. And all of them have their own little quirks. And, you know, if I was to put them up to the test, of course, the, of the three of these, the original is hands down by far the best. It has a much smoother action. It locks up better. Uh, the spring's a little heavier. The loading lever is just smooth as butter. I'm not saying that these are bad, but I would say that the Pieta comes in third. The Uberti Cimarron import here comes in second with, of course, the original by a mile coming in first. Back to what we were talking about. Samuel Colt is still under the impression he needs to save weight. And about the only way he can do that is to flute the cylinders. Now, let's have a side-by-side -side comparison with a 51 Navy. Now, this is an original, but as you can see, the cylinder is completely round on the 51 Navy here. However, it's fluted here, and this does cut some weight and make the gun balance better, but it creates another issue, the thin chamber walls. We'll also notice here that we once again have the root patent loading lever, only instead of being the small one on the 55 root, this is a big old loading lever. And you can see the nubbins there where it grabs the bottom of the barrel and you have more mechanical advantage than you do on the 51 Navy. As you can see, it only has one pinch point. As you can see, it only has one pinch point there and when it comes down, you only have one point of mechanical advantage. We've discussed all this in the 1855 new pocket model or the root revolver video. One video back in the series if you care to go and check it out. However, lightening the revolver didn't come without its drawbacks. As they say, in physics, there's no such thing as a free lunch. This lighter revolver with this heavy charge did produce quite a bit of recoil. And so as Colt was messing around with things, it was decided that the 51 Navy grip was just too small. Now, a lot of people love this grip, myself included. And so what he would do is he would put a modified version of the old Dragoon grip on it. 
Now if I can show you, prop these up, you will see, now if I show you, you will see the 1860 Army stands up slightly taller than the 1851 Navy. That is because the grip is longer. The grip is slightly belled out more at the bottom with more of a curve in here, right here, to accommodate for that recoil. You can get a much better hand purchase on this grip. However, it makes carrying it a little bit more of a pain. Okay, so Colt has this pistol. Of course, he can't sell it because it has patents still pertaining to it that are enforceable, such as the creeping loading lever we just discussed and the lead-in notches into the cylinder stops, which were still under patent in 1860. So, what did Colt do? He made a non-patented 1860 Army, and that is what collectors refer to them as today, non-patented 1860 armies. Here's just a few pictures. Here we have some pictures of some non-patent army pistols, which it's just an 1860, but with the old loading lever and no safety pins, and no key lead into the cylinder. They were only used for test and evaluation, and only seven were known to exist. One was completely unmarked. It was in the Colt collection in the 20th century. However, due to some very underhanded dealings, it was traded out of the Colt collection, and now it's considered lost. However, the one marked serial number four somehow got out of the Colt collection and is now located in the Gene Autry Museum. Serial number seven was in the Colt collection, but was traded out in 1980 under the assumption that they were duplicates of 1860 armies. Yes, some very underhanded trading. Now, as you can see, the no patent law was definitely a pain to Colt, something that was really causing him some financial issues. But he didn't quit, he kept improving on the gun. Now let's go back and look at a few more comparisons. We have three screws. And these are all integral parts of the action. However, in 1858, for the third model Dragoon in trials, when attaching the shoulder stock, they had come out with what we now call the four screw. Now, we call it a four screw because if you look here, we have one, two, three, four screws, and the recoil shield is cut right here. Now what that's for is for a stock. The stock would sit down on this right here, which is the fourth screw, and it would lock down in place and catch up here in the recoil shield. And there was another screw down here that would lock this part of the stock onto the butt. That's what that little indention down there is for, if anybody ever wondered. However, the reason I say there's five screws is because we have one, two, three, four, and then on this side we have five. But like I said, this is known as the four screw model. It's for a stock. And many of the early 1860 armies were cut for the stock with four screws, and we call them four screw models. However, three screw models of the time do exist. All right, so Colt has this gun. He has a complete factory set up to make it, men waiting to make it, but the government won't buy it. But does that stop Colt? No. If the government won't buy his gun, he'll go find someone who can. And that someone was Charles Lamar of Georgia. Now we get into the fun stuff. Confederate 1860 armies. Now some people would call Colt a traitor. And many other names for uh, selling guns to the South. <laughs> Not me. I really am kind of happy that he did. But the thing is, it was not illegal to trade guns with the South up until April 19th of 1861 when Lincoln declared the blockade. Before that, you could basically do anything. Even though the Southern states had seceded from the Union, secession had been declared, but hostilities had not yet begun. Now then, the first hundred of these, like I said, went to a man named Charles Lamar in Savannah, Georgia. Charles Lamar was the head of the Savannah Militia and a firebrand for the Confederates, and also the first major purchaser of the 1860 Army, buying 100 guns at $25 apiece. He also convinced Colt to change the address on the gun from Hartford, Connecticut to New York City so as not to have a tie to an actual northern state. However, our Charles Lamar was killed on April 16, 1865 at Columbus, Georgia, one of the last major battles of the war. Charles A. Lamar received the first 100 Colts on November 30th of 1860. They had the army size grip, fluted cylinder, but barrel length was unknown. 
and none of them that we know of survive. Now, let's talk about barrel length. Many people assume that if your gun is lower, your 1860 army is lower than the number 8000 in serial number, you will have a fluted cylinder and a 7.5 inch barrel. I assumed the same thing. It's not true. As you just saw, the barrel length on the test models was one of them 8 inch, one of them 7.5. And as far back as the very first order to Lamar, we do not know if that one was eight inch or seven and a half, but we do know that the Texas orders and several other were for a mix of seven and a half and eight inch barrels. The seven and a half inch barrel was predominant at this point, but there were eight inch barrels below the serial number of 8,000. Now, Lamar bought the first hundred pistols with his own money under the assumption that the CSA would pay him for them. Of course, they never did next sell that Colt made was to the state of Georgia for a grand total of 300 pistols. They were delivered on December 27th of 1860. As you recall, this is all perfectly legal until April 19th of 1861. Here's the summary for the state of Georgia. The order was for 300. The ship date was December 27th of 1860. These were configuration of 8 inch barrels, some with plated straps, all observed examples have four screw frames and fluted cylinders. They were in the serial number range of 500 to 2400. They were used by the Phillips Legion and probably the Georgia Hussars. And we know that 43 of these still survive. After Georgia bought their 300 pistols, Colt next would sell to F.B. Loney, Baltimore, Maryland, one of his agents there, which of course was selling to the state of Maryland, which, contrary to popular belief, was a Confederate state. Now this order was for 25 and they shipped them January 9th of 1861. Ooh, we're getting closer to that date. They had a seven and a half inch barrel. All observed examples have four screw frames and fluted cylinders and their serial numbers are between 200 and 1800 and we know of five still existing. All of this is very interesting. Up to this point, Colt cannot legally be held responsible for anything that he's doing as far as selling guns to not necessarily the CSA in particular, but to different states and agents down through the South. However, things were starting to change. With the states seceding one after another and the blockade on the horizon, Samuel Colt knew that things were about to get tight. Let me read you a letter that he wrote February 18th, 1861 to Richard Jarvis. He wrote, Quote, say to Mr. Root and Mr. Lord that they must do their best to turn off our arms, run the armory night and day with double sets of hands until we get 5,000 or 10,000 ahead of each kind. I had rather have an accumulation of our arms than to have money lying idle, and we cannot have too many on hand to meet the exigencies of the time. It is not unlikely we will soon be changing to the machinery of the plain rifles with the sword and bayonet, as well as large supplies of arms which are much wanted now. Judging from the news I have received from New Orleans since I arrived, make hay while the sun shines, end quote. I like that. Now, you have to remember, when he wrote that letter, the government still was not purchasing any of his pistols. It was still illegal for the United States. So who was he selling them to? Anybody in the South that could get their hands on them. Colt's next sell would be to William M. Sage of Charleston, South Carolina. It was a shipment of 50, and it shipped January 15, 1861. These were all 7.5 inch barrels, brass finished trigger guards. All observed examples have four screw frames and fluted cylinders. Serial numbers range between 200 and 1900. They were possibly used by the Charleston Light Dragoons or the Holcomb Legion Cavalry. Well, we know that there are still 10 of these existing. Colt's next sell, sell to the south would be to W.T. Martin. He sold 160 1860 armies with 80 stocks. The ship date on these is January 17, 1861. These all have 8-inch barrels, brass finished trigger guards. All observed examples now have four screw frames and fluted cylinders with a serial number range between 1100 and 1700. They went to Adams Troop, a company of the Jeff Davis Legion, and we now know that 23 of these still exist. But was Colt done? Not yet, because 
on January 19th, he made another shipment to John and Thomas Jones of Augusta, Georgia. This was for 12 pistols with seven and a half inch barrels. Their serial numbers were between 700 and 2300, and none of these still exist. Colt still made one more shipment on February 6th of 1861 of 12 revolvers to Kittred and Folsom, New Orleans. And this was a shipment for only 12 pistols once again, and it was made February 6th of 1861. These are seven and a half inch barrels with their serial number range between eight and 900. Uh, we don't know who used them and we don't have any surviving examples of these. Now came the big sell. February 1st of 1861, the state of Texas seceded from the Union. On February 24th, a man named Ben McCulloch wrote a letter to Colt requesting arms to protect the frontier. Now, many times we've heard that he promised Colt that if Colt would sell the state of Texas firearms, they would not be used against the Union forces. However, looking at what I have just seen and what we have just discussed, I don't think this was necessary if it ever even happened. I haven't found the account of him saying such things because Colt was already hawking these things to everywhere in the South that would buy them. The plan was to send them by steamer down to New Orleans and have them brought into Texas. This was the fastest way to do it. However, the guns didn't ship out till March 28th, and by then the Union Army was searching and seizing ships that had cargo bound for the South. But the first 250 guns were placed on the steamship Benville, which somehow managed to get out of port with all the guns still intact. By the way, that steamship would later become a Union military ship. They arrived in New Orleans April 9th of 1861. Yeah, things are really getting tight. The blockade is coming. Now the thing was, they weren't to be unloaded until they were paid for. However, the state of Texas couldn't pay for them until August. Eventually Colt worked a deal with them that they would pay later. They never did. However, I think that Colt didn't mind necessarily because he always had a soft spot in his heart for the state of Texas and the Texas Rangers that had given him his start many years before. However, this was just too risky. They could not send the next 750 of that thousand by steamship. It was just too risky. But they came by way of wagon. These were sent across land to avoid the blockade. They went to the first and second Texas mounted rifles, which were commanded respectively by Henry McCulloch and Rip Ford a Texas Ranger with which we will be talking about here in just a little bit. Here is the order summary of the Texas Colts. They ordered 1,000, the ship 250 on March 28th, and 750 on April 9th of 1861. They all have 8 inch barrels, brass finish trigger guards, all observed examples have 4 screw frames and fluted cylinders. The serial number range is between 200 and 4,700, 90% were above 2,000. They were used by the first and second Texas mounted rifles, and we have 49 still today. The next sell Colt would make was to a Mr. Thomas Dreyer for 1,000 pistols. Mr. Dreyer was an agent directly for the Confederate States of America. This time, Colt was selling directly to the Confederate government. Now, Thomas Dreyer ordered 1,000. Colt got to work and made 500 and they were delivered to Richmond. This didn't go unnoticed by what is now known as the Vigilance Committee. And this is a letter from the Vigilance Committee from April 15, 1861. It is gathered from reliable sources that you are manufacturing and shipping arms south, arms south in all capital letters, in response to orders from traders now, sir, I am able to inform you if you fulfill any more orders or ship further supplies south from this date, your establishment will be most thoroughly cleaned out. Yours with respect due to a traitor. The Vigilance Committee. So on April 22nd, the first 500 of the thousand order shipment to the Confederate States of America arrived in Richmond. However, with this strongly worded letter, Colt soon saw that the writing was on the wall. He was going to have to pick a side. However, there was that pesky little law about patented firearms being purchased by the government. 
So what we end up with is the Confederate States of America purchase summary of 500 out of 1,000. They shipped April 15th of 1861 and arrived April 22nd in Richmond. They had fluted cylinders, the army size grip, seven and a half inch barrel. Serial numbers range from 100 to 4,000. They were used in the CSS Sumpner, the CSS Alabama, the CSS Tuscaloosa, unknown CSA cavalry units, and we know that 55 still exist to this day. On April 12th, Beauregard fired on Sumpner, and the war was on. On April 12th, the U.S. Secretary of War attempted to issue 50 Colt Navy revolvers from the U.S. Armory to Ward H. Lamon, the U.S. Marshal of Washington, D.C., and a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln. He received 12, and he was informed that there were no more Colt revolvers left in inventory. The Ordnance Department went into a frenzy. Immediately, the no patent law was thrown to the wind. They had no idea how bad this situation had become. They ordered 100 pistols from Colt. And this put Colt in a bind as he was still in the process of making pistols for the Confederacy, of which he had only made 500. He wrote the U.S. Ordnance Department that it would take 30 days to fill the order. He knew, however, he would have to pick a side. With the blockade setting up, he knew that money lay with the Union. He stopped work on the Confederate guns and took up the offer for $25 apiece. On the 2nd of May, 1861, Colt received his first major U.S. order for 51860 armies, and on the 3rd, responded with a telegram saying, Established price, $25, can deliver 500 this week and 400 every week thereafter. He had chosen his side and was on his way into a war. On March 6th of 1861, H.D. Norton of San Antonio, the man who was responsible for the Texas revolvers, wrote Colt a letter stating that he had just seen an 1860 Army fluted cylinder blown up. Colt immediately asked him to send the cylinder back and that he would send some replacement somehow. Soon a bunch of cylinders were coming in. All of them exploded. On July 3rd, 1861, Colt's own inspector stated that of the last 50 1860 armies they had proof, all 50 had burst within 10 rounds using only round ball and 37 grains of powder. Colt immediately went to work rectifying this. So here was what the real problem was with the fluted cylinder. It wasn't necessarily that the walls were too thin, it was that where the cylinder notches were cut was too thin. Now, Colt would go in and actually cone this instead of being 44 or 45 all the way through, it's actually .454, he would make it a .454 at the mouth and cone it. And that basically fixed the issue. However, there was still a stigma around the fluted cylinders with the fear that they might blow up and so Colt would switch over to what we now know today as the rebated cylinder. As you can see it still stepped into the frame down here but it is round with the navy scene on it. And that navy scene does not mean that it is a navy revolver. It is just the scene that Colt uses on both the Army and Navy revolvers at this point. Besides, it's not the American Navy anyway. It's the Texas Navy. So, although you could now order a fluted cylinder from Colt, special order, from now on, basically all 1860 armies would have the, what he referred to as the cavalry cylinder, the belted cylinder, the rebated cylinder, however you want to call it. With all this steel, it was just much cheaper to produce. Now that we have discussed the CSA first model fluted cylinder version of the 1860 Army, let's take this out and shoot it. See how we like this Cimarron imported Uberti. Alright, now it's time to load her up. Just like any other cap and ball revolver, we're going to put it on half cock. Now that last round of cartridges we ran through wasn't even lubed, so the gun is still functioning perfectly fine. This particular gun does have a very tight cylinder gap, and so it does fall out quicker than most Colts. Now, this is not like our other videos where we use loose 
powder and ball if you want to go back and check those videos out you can today we are using the Dustin Weiniger Guns of the West cartridges these are round ball cartridges and we're just gonna slide that thing in there like that and then you place it under your hammer pull down now this gun cuts a really good ring of lead and leaves a ring of paper there for good measure and you will just repeat that five more times and now we're going to take some Remington number 10 caps place them on the nipples like that and then I like to take a screwdriver plastic handle of a screwdriver and keep your fingers out of in front of the cylinder and give them a little press set and we'll do that five more times all right so after you have your Remington caps all on remember this gun is live to fire so very carefully you're going to take your hammer and set it on the safety pin make sure the cylinder cannot move now you're safe to carry all six some people still just load five and that's absolutely fine all right let's take a few shots where the And the cotton fields are blue with Sherman's crew. Yesterday I heard a Yankee say, Yesterday the school fell. So I'm on my way to do my part. General Lee might need my help. So look away. Look away, Dixie. I don't want you to see what they're doing to you, Dixie. God bless Robert E. Lee. Cimarron's 1860 Army. Texas model. Now we're officially done with the fluted cylinder. Now the 1860 Army would definitely be the predominant firearm of the North in the Civil War. And the South too, if they could get their hands on them. So, all told, according to Colt records, Colt sold to the South 2,159 1860 Model Armies before the Union purchased a single one. Alright, now this revolver was very popular during the Civil War account after account of soldier absolutely loving this gun however this thing was around too it has some issues though such as well-documented accounts of the cylinder fouling out it never was an issue with the 1860 army for one main reason we still have this open top whereas sam colt had in 1855 already put a top strap on a revolver the reason he left this open up here is so that fouling can escape out the top of the cylinder gap and not bind that cylinder up where it'll stop. Now, how popular was this gun? In only two years of production, the United States ordered 119,000 of these. Now, I know that Wikipedia page says that they ordered 127,000. I'm going to go with the book on this. And the reason I think the Wikipedia page states that by the time that the Union military quit purchasing these firearms that there was probably 127,000 made all told counting Confederate and civilian sales but as far as the United States military in the Civil War is concerned or the United States military is concerned period they only purchased 119,000 of these revolvers now why is that for the first two years they were the most popular revolver on the battlefield but they came at a price of $25 each, with which Remington, as we said before, only cost $15 each. There was a few other issues. If you go back to our Walker video, you'll recall the issues that arose between Colt and the government over things like flasks and bullet molds. Well, Samuel Colt, the reason he charged $25 a piece is because these guns were still being sold with a flask and a bullet mold all the way up until 1863. However, by this point, the United States military is definitely not using the flasks 
and very rarely using the bullet molds. As a matter of fact, it is costing the United States government to store all the flasks and bullet molds that are coming out. They have 119,000 bullet molds just laying around. By the way, they're paying quite a bit of money for these. So, the Ordnance Department went to the Colt factory. By now, 1863, Colt has passed away and Elijah K. Root is in charge of the factory. We'll get into that in a few more episodes, but needless to say, they come to both Remington and Colt requesting that no longer would they have to purchase the bullet molds and the flasks, and that Colt and Remington would both drop the price. Remington was more than happy to do this and immediately dropped their price from $15 to $13 each. However, Elijah K. Root was not the businessman that Colt was. He may have thought that he was acting as Colt would have acted and dug his heels in. However, having studied Colt, I don't think that's how Colt would have acted. He would have hemmed and hawed and wrote a few letters here and schemed a little there and got his way, probably, but he would have never just dug his heels in and stood stiff. That's what Root did, and that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And on November 14, 1863, all contracts for the 1860 Army from the Colt factory were terminated. Colt, the government had had enough of these expensive guns. They had already bought over 100,000 of them. They were not going to buy any more. In early 1864, the Colt factory burned down. Again, something we'll get to in a few more episodes. So, the 1860 line for the government was done. They never made another purchase after November 14th of 1863, as I said, having purchased 119,000 revolvers. Now, does this mean that this is the end of the Colt 1860 Army? Absolutely not. Civilian sales would go on after the factory was rebuilt, and so would foreign sales. Many foreign countries used the 1860 Army. All right, so now that we've gotten through with the Civil War orders of both the North and the South, let's take this old girl out and let's shoot it and see what we think. And while we're out there, we'll throw in a few shots from the old Pieta too. All right, so now we're gonna load up our 1860 Army here. And this is the original, and this one was made in 1862. It's got all the proper markings, it's all matching. There's even still a little bit of the inspector's cartouche right there. But I just wanted to show you, we're gonna load it with paper cartridges from Dustin Weiniger, just like uh, we did before with the fluted cylinder model. But I just wanna show you the difference here. You saw how difficult it was to load the fluted model reproduction. Well, I'm gonna put this on half cock. Now this is replicating pretty much exactly what an original loading would have been like. This barrel is opened up so much more that instead of fighting that round ball down in there, it just falls because there's more space here in the loading chamber. And then you push that under there. Now watch this, guys. Whoop! So much easier. It did cut a little ring of lead, not as big, but that's okay because remember, this chamber is coned in here. And so what you're doing is even if you don't cut a complete ring of lead since the chamber's tapered going down, you're swaging the ball in as you go. It gets a little harder right there at the very base, but overall it's, it's completely sealed and nothing bad's gonna happen. Now we will repeat that process and we'll load it in the same way that we did the 1860 Army fluted cylinder from Cimarron. All right guys, we're just gonna cap this up right here. You're just gonna take just like the other one and the nipples are just a touch bigger actually on this gun i don't know if uh cci 11s or remington number 11s might fit it a little better but they cap very easily because of this pronounced groove right here basically you just slide the cap down in there and slide it on now we are going to set the cap screwdriver and we're going to repeat that process five more times Take a shot at the big plate in the middle. Don't take a moment to think, dear John, our country calls and go. Don't fear for me nor the children, John. I'll care for them, you know. Leave the corn upon the stone. Take your gun and go, dear John.
Yes, take your gun and go For Ruth can drive the ox to John And I can use the hoe The army showed a blanket John Here, take this heavy pearl I spun and wove them as a girl And worked them with great care Take your gun and go, dear John Yes, take your gun Try this one more time. There's a hit. All right, what do you say we try loading this gun with paper cartridges and seeing what we get done? All right, now let's try some paper cartridges in the Pieta. Now, the Pieta has the worst um, loading port out of all three of the guns we've shot today. So it is gonna be a little bit of a trick to even get a round ball cartridge. You gotta see toward the paper, but Ooh. And we can't hardly get the cartridge into the port. And it also has the smallest chamber diameter. Ugh. I think we're only going to load one paper cartridge in this gun today. We'll see how it does. We'll shoot the rest of them out with the original because I'm just going to be honest, guys. The original is 100 times more fun to shoot. And go ahead and spin that around to where I see it. Eh, I'm gonna cap her up. Anyway, guys, that is the Pieta 1860 Army. Good gun. I mean, it shoots higher than the other two that we've shot today by about three inches, maybe four. And uh, it doesn't have the good loading port for cartridges and the spring is a little light but if you're just loading loose powder and ball and you were able to it, it could just be this gun the springs light in too but if you're just loading loose powder and ball you'd probably be fine with the Pieta version of the 1860 army let's load up and shoot this original again one more time that's just so much fun There's not very much liquid in that bottle, guys. That and it's friends. But we got a little bit out of it. A little above the water. There's not very much liquid in that bottle, guys. That and it's friends. But we got a little bit. Alright guys, now that we've pretty well thoroughly tested both of these guns, let's see what these guns will do at card table distances, both the original and the Pieta. Oh, and the Pieta. Alright guys, whoop, we dropped the loading lever. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. That was two grain, two charges, both of them were 30 plus grains in the cylinders, so they both did just fine, they both went off. All right, I gotta say, this one, the original, hands down, 1,000 times better than the replicas. The Uberti comes in second, the Pieta comes in third. However, these guns, guys, you gotta get them, you gotta shoot them, even if they're just the replicas, because they are just a blast to shoot. Let's go back to the table. Oh yeah, and one more thing, paper cartridges guys might be the way we go from now on. It's just so much handier out at the range. It's taken us literally half the time to film this shooting segment that it normally would use in loose powder and ball. Let's go back to the table. After the war, the government had some serious issues with Native Americans in the West. And many of those original 119,000 guns would be fixed, repurposed, and sent west. As a matter of fact, even though the government was no longer purchasing the 1860 Army, they were still purchasing parts. Oh, and by the way, they were still purchasing 51 navies all the way through. They loved that gun. Now, 
Of all those government guns that went west, many of them wound up in the Indian Wars. That was a very, still very popular firearm. However, new things were just around the corner. It was not very far from the end of the Civil War till 1869. Roland White's patent for the board through cylinder expired. Cartridges were right around the corner. However, these guns were still popular and they were still being sold. The last shipment of 1860 armies shipped out of the factory on May 1st of 1872. It was a shipment of 25. So now, from what I can come up with, the overall number of 1860 armies produced is around 186,000. Once again, Wikipedia will say over 200,000. Now, this time, I think I know what they're doing. I think they're including parts that were later on made to facilitate the creation of conversion revolvers, which we'll get into in another day. But once again, I'm going with the books and saying 186,000 were made. This turned out to be Colt's dream gun. It was the big power of the Dragoon, the nimbleness and lightness of the 51 Navy, and was just an all around hit with everyone who used it. And anyway, that's all we have at long last for the 1860 Army. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, we had a lot of help in this video. Holsters were produced by Duke Fraser Productions. The cartridges we used were made from a kit from Guns of the West, Dustin Weiniger. And we've had a lot of information and help from the Wild Snapper. I just want to thank all those guys before we end here. As always, trust in God. Keep your powder dry. Bye.